have with us today, Mario Vivas, who's joining us from his organization, River Horse. And I actually learned from him that River Horse is another name that she used to talk about hippos. So I learned about a little bit about his logo yesterday. Mario is the chief education officer within his organization. And so a lot of his focus is on education that helps people understand the ServiceNow tool. But certainly in order to do that, we need for folks also to understand the IDLE 4 practices. And so that's what he's going to do in his webinar today. He's going to bring those two concepts together. So Mario, you've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to right away send it over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. So exactly as Donna mentioned, our goal for the next hour will be to make sure that we highlight some of the differences that IDLE 4 has introduced and uh, get a general sense of the capabilities of the ServiceNow platform and how it is that we can adopt some of these new aspects of the framework. Our focus will be on the ITSM operational processes and the applications in ServiceNow that are equivalent to that so that we can show how those overall practices can be delivered on the platform. Now, just to add a little bit there for my background, I am the founder and chief education officer of River Horse, and we do indeed focus on how it is that we can apply IT industry standards on various IT technologies. We have specialized on the ServiceNow platform with all of our education advisors having years of experience as architects, technical consultants, and business consultants implementing ServiceNow. And we're very proud that we are an official authorized training partner of the ServiceNow organization and can teach over 19 of the official ServiceNow courses. I myself actually started off as a customer of ServiceNow. I was a process manager that served at the back end of the major banks up here in Canada, based out of Toronto. And I was responsible at the time for incident problem and knowledge. And we were looking to implement everything that was available on the Now platform. So we started off looking at it in the spring 2009 release. And by the time that we went live, we were moving forward with Aspen. So from there, I shifted over to consulting and I've had the pleasure of working with all the major releases that have been named after cities. Now, while I was serving as a process manager, I did manage to achieve my IDLE V3 expert designation. And in fact, I actually took several classes that were led by our colleagues here from ITSM Academy. So thanks to Lisa and the team helping me to kickstart my career all those years ago. And since then, I have attended the latest versions of IDLE 4 Foundations and the transition course that ITSM Academy offers just to catch up on everything that is new on the latest standard. And so with that, I do want to make sure that we have a chance to highlight those major changes and understand how that could potentially impact our operational practices that we run day to day in ServiceNow. So the big piece here when we start looking at IDLE 4 is understanding the history of how things have changed since it was first adopted globally. When we started off looking at IDLE, it was about helping to establish best practice guidance for IT service management, how to best support our businesses so that we can establish a framework and a common language for how we organize ourselves to deliver our high quality, high value services. Now, in today's modern world, the distinction between IT technologies and service delivery, it's all combined now. And really, we all need to refocus on an all-encompassing service management that we all help to realize. So when IDLE 4 was being put together, the concept of all the granular processes and procedures, they were repositioned into higher level practices that help us to facilitate that value proposition of the services. Now, if you take the IDLE 4 Foundations course, you'll learn very much about these different images that you're seeing on screen, the service value system and the service value chain. What they help to understand is how all our different components, all the activities of the organization work together as an overall system to enable the value creation. It's really a evolution of what was introduced in the IDLE V3 2011 service lifecycle. And so what IDLE 4 is doing is reshaping all of our ITSM practices into wider contexts of customer experience, value streams, digital transformation, and systems thinking, all the while embracing some of the new ways that we work, like Agile, Lean, and DevOps. So when we look at the 
idle for practices, they are evolutions of what we had for our idle v3 2011 processes. And the processes they represent are just one of the dimensions that you're seeing here at the bottom of the overall activities that we perform for the service delivery. When we start looking at service now, it is a technology that helps to fit into that fourth element, but the overall dimensions are all encompassing. And so we do want to recognize those other aspects are facilitated using a platform like ServiceNow. Now, if you're curious about all these other aspects, I definitely encourage you to take a look at the Idle 4 webinars that are available on IT uh, Assembly Academy's website. So you can look at the archives, understand some of these differences, or take a look at the foundations course. Now, when we start looking at it from the context of ServiceNow, we would start with the ITSM product suite. So our incident problem chain, service catalog knowledge, all the common applications that we start off with as a baseline. But you'll realize quickly that the platform can support many other idle practices beyond service level management, configuration management, and then our connection to many of the other product suites on the platform. So if we start doing a deeper dive into the ITSM focused processes or practices, starting off with the big one, the most common starting point being incident management. Some of the aspects that are being highlighted here are common elements that we would see within the platform. So the first aspect here in helping to detect incidents early, registering them automatically or using machine learning, we'll see that with ServiceNow, we do have the ability to integrate with different monitoring tool sets. There is an event management solution as well so that we can start to raise the issues quickly and have resources now start to analyze the details rather than trying to gather the initial information to first initiate this practice. When we start looking at the ability to resolve or do our investigation and diagnosis activities, again, our goal is to be able to integrate the different methods that we would gather information across the different practices. So if we are looking at what information was available in our monitoring tool sets or event management, what we have done so far in the world of problem management, do we have anything available within the knowledge space that can help us to determine what the issue is, maybe present a workaround to close out some of the incidents? Those are all aspects that when we look at a platform like ServiceNow, they're already inherent in the solution. So as you go through the individual steps, you will very easily be able to recognize whether there are other record types already available or have automation where that it will go and create the corresponding record type. We'll see that with things like service level management. If we do have well-established CMDB, then we can have the vital business functions all recognized and acknowledged so that we have timers in the background and escalate accordingly. One other aspect that it continues to be a theme across idle 4 is recognizing that we need to continually gather information to improve the approach of the delivery of the process and also being able to automate. So if we are able to review the data, then we can come up with models or in ServiceNow they'll call them templates. And so you can create a templated approach for any of the record types really, but for incident, just as that starting point to either recognize immediately a knowledge article to get to that workaround or route us over into problem for a further analysis. Now, one other aspect that you'll see and we'll recognize a little later as well is agile approaches, like the, what we can do with uh, Kanban. In ServiceNow, we have something called the visual task boards. And so that will be our approach for dynamically interacting with the platform and associating record types to individuals or to each record type and moving through the life cycle all within nice drag and drop layout. So a few different aspects to consider. One, one last piece I do want to highlight that Idle recognizes is the need for us to have AI available to help to provide that automation as you're raising the incidents. And so in ServiceNow, we do have an enhanced version now as part of the latest release that's spanning across multiple different applications. The incident process actually was the first of the applications to have some recommendations for what you should associate to based off of categorization, prioritization, or the CI that was selected, as well as the assignment. Uh, so all those different aspects are part of the emphasis of the updated incident management practice. Now, as we shift over to problem, 
people. We want to make sure that we understand who will be able to register our problem. The overall practice has been updated to have multiple phases. We have our proactive approach, our reactive, and then we shift over to problem control and error control. Many of us have focused on the reactive nature just because of the different technologies that we may have in place and then starting off our deep dive root cause analysis investigations. But we want to recognize that as we start shifting into those deeper dive reviews, that we are able to place information, publish them as known errors or in service now as articles that can be leveraged in the incident space, but that those can shift, they can evolve. Our infrastructure, our technologies that we have available in delivering our services, they are always changing. And so the concept of having a single root cause, it's, it would help for us to expand beyond just the one aspect and looking at that deeper dive. And that's why usually we want to focus on the longer term investigation and the potential benefits to permanently address an issue as part of problem. So when we look at some of the example inputs for what we could be doing there and helping to open up any proactive problem records, looking at error information from our vendors and suppliers, we would be able to automatically create proactive problems working with our vendor partners in ServiceNow. So if you are using a partner, double check if they have any of their information that they could publish into a knowledge base, and that could then feed into the ServiceNow knowledge base automatically and inform your team that these new articles are available. If they are also leveraging the ServiceNow platform, it's very easy for us to integrate from one ServiceNow instance to another. And in fact, you could have activities that would be assigned to your vendors so that they can help us in addressing our longer term problems. Now, change management, this one is an interesting one. It has been adjusted to be called change enablement as part of the overall practice. And the, the biggest change here is the focus on embracing agile approaches. When we look at the feedback that people have given to this process in the past, it was always that upfront information that was needed to first raise a request for change and have it, the full details available for us to then submit it for review and approval. So a very heavy process for us to first initiate and then from there get into our design, build, and test activities. Well, with the latest version here with change enablement and recognizing that development has gone with a more agile approach, anything that is available as background requirements could be listed as a backlog and can serve as your request for change to represent the activities that we would have upfront from the practice. So if we are able to then leverage any standard models here, then we could have some of those activities automatically scheduled rather than having to go through change advisory board to validate what could potentially be at risk and then from there choosing the exact time and activity to take place. So if you are able to look at smaller changes and then if even further to that, add in some automation, then the platform can help to combine all of those in the same fashion where you'd have the overall change record that can have release records tied to them. And then there's actually something new as part of the Orlando release focused on DevOps, where you could integrate with other tool sets. If you have been using Jira, let's say, as your tool set for application development and want to be able to schedule that with something like Jenkins to automatically go and install, we can have that full collection of applications and integrations help us to improve the adoption of this process. One other aspect that we want to make sure that is reinforced in the latest version of change is the concept of leveraging models. So similar to what we said here for incident, if you wanted to create templates within ServiceNow, that could help to alleviate the population of some of your standard information requirements. But we know that there are some industries that will need to have further scrutiny with outlining the potential risk and backup plans. But if there are standard operating procedures, those are all great candidates to put into models or templates in ServiceNow. And as you raise your change, you can just invoke that template and then have many of the aspects pre-populated. One other aspect that is really focused on in Idle 4 is our ability to delegate authority. 
We want to make sure that we are able to shift left any of the review and initial setup of activity so that we can avoid some of that bottleneck of waiting for a manager or a overall authority body in our organization to move forward. For a good indicator of that is to see how many changes have to wait for a change manager or change advisory board to review the records. If it's something that is using standard templates or the concept of a standard change type, then many aspects should just be moving forward into scheduling rather than having to wait for our CABs to go and review and approve. And further to that, when we start looking at the approvals, if you are able to automate any approval aspects, you will see in the platform that we have what are called change approval policies. You can make them quite dynamic in changing for different circumstances. You are also able to use the updated mobile application or integrations to other tool sets to keep track of approvals. So that you don't, again, get bogged down with having to go into ServiceNow and approve a record or read a cumbersome email. You can have the lovely dashboards as well as use mobile solutions for adding some quickness into the review and approval. For request management, so request, we continue with the overall concept of the model management. If we are able to put in standard templates within ServiceNow, that can help us in selecting the different routes of activity that happen in the background. With the service catalog, it does have the ability to now leverage the flow designer, which is the latest version of workflow automation for the platform. If you are looking at being able to add in different layers of review and approval or integrations into other tool sets, it is possible for you to then automatically spin up a new database and have it decommissioned using integration hub. So these concepts, they are, of course, overall global in nature, but they do become much more specific in how we outline the procedures and then select which ones to automate in service now. One other aspect here is making sure that we have the distinction between incident management and service requests for anybody that has worked in implementing so the ServiceNow platform. We know that, that this is a very common pain point. So being able to show that we can go from one path to the other. So if you are raising an incident as an overall IT ticket, and then from there shifting that to be one of our standard models from, from the service request world, very, very easy for us to recognize that and create and share information between their two record types. We can also leverage service level management here. The SLAs in, in service now, many of us will automatically equate that to incident, but it is a standalone application. It is something that we could associate to any of the other record types in the platform. So if you are trying to keep track of response times for what we do here in request or change, and if we move beyond into any of the other task types, how long it takes for us to complete any of our uh, sprint cycles, all those record types can have an SLA definition associated to them. For knowledge management, so for this process, it continues to look to push for a culture of sharing knowledge and the different methods to present them. And so you'll see with uh, what we do in ServiceNow, we do have updated knowledge portals that resources will be able to review. Built into incident management and the service catalog or service requests, you'll be able to use the contextual search. So as you start typing something into a short description, it can give you recommendations for which record types to, to create or, or associate to. One other aspect that IDLE has been looking to, to push forward here that can help create that culture is the ability to integrate with social collaboration tool sets. And we'll see with ServiceNow that we definitely have a built-in collaboration tool, but they did recognize that potential integration to other tool sets that you may be using. And again, the concept of being able to make decisions earlier in the overall life cycle or shift, shift left it still applies here. And so if we are able to share as much information within our uh, knowledge bases, and then from there have our users either use them as they're raising their records, or if they are looking for just high level information to make sure they recognize what activities will take place in the practices, that can help us in making sure that the services are well understood and what expectations we have. Now, there is plenty of other information that we could highlight when it comes to IO4. 
The Foundation's book is available, and if you are looking for that, I definitely encourage you to take a look at the Axel site and understand what other aspects are available. The individual practices, they also will have their own full practice guides. Many of them are still being refined. So if you are interested in that, I do encourage you to take a look at what's available there. Now, if you want to have more of an all-encompassing understanding of what Idle 4 brings, would definitely recommend taking a look at the ITSM Academy Idle 4 Foundations course. Now, with that being said, we do want to have a chance to see how far we've gone on our Idle 4 journeys. So we're going to be running a poll here, just a couple of minutes for you to let us know if you have already started down the Idle 4 path or if it's something that uh, you're going to be looking to pursue in the near future. So, Maria, the poll is open so, and folks are weighing in. We'll give it 20, 30 seconds for everybody to respond. Just getting introduced to Idle 4, interested in attending Idle 4 Foundation, already Idle 4 Foundation certified. And, Maria, the one thing I would add while people are responding is that what's a little bit different about Idle 4 is that for every one of the major certification classes, it has its own publication. And that's that's kind of what we're trying to show in that slide. So we have our responses. In 10 seconds, I'm going to close the slides. Mario, thus far, we have 46% just getting introduced to Idle 4, which is awesome. 24% interested in attending Foundation, and 30% of the folks out there have already attended Idle 4 Foundation. So that's excellent. So I'm going to close the poll. And just to let everybody see the final results. So it's always exciting to me as an educator to see folks who are just getting introduced to something and learning new things. And we're all learning Idle 4 together. So that's, that's the fun part. So again, just on this slide very quickly, you can see that for every major one of these certification classes, there is a core publication associated with this class. So that's the structure, the new structure for the Idle 4 module. So back to you, Mary. All right. Thank you for that. So now then, in understanding the capabilities of the ServiceNow platform and how we can instill some of these concepts that are being introduced from Idle 4 into ServiceNow, we'll see that there are a lot of built-in baseline features as well as additional plugins that you can introduce to make sure that you have that alignment. Now, taking a step back here in general with the latest version of ServiceNow, the Orlando release, it was actually just recently introduced to, to be live. So I think it was literally like the last week. <laughs> We can see that we now have 10 overall major product lines. There are over 58 major applications as you go through these different products that align to different industry standards and processes. When we start looking at what we can add on to them, there are over 400 different plugins for additional functionality. So them, some of them are smaller if we're looking at something like a language pack. Some of them are much larger when we look at, let's say, introducing IT business management in our organization, having projects and agile print stories and so on created. So lots to choose from that ServiceNow offers. Now, in addition to that, they have a very strong vendor partner community that is building unique applications that you can take a look at on the ServiceNow store. That may include some of the other big vendors that you're working with and making sure that you can integrate their solutions into ServiceNow. And that has been something common that ServiceNow has been reviewing, updating, and adding into a standard collection for you to choose from. So they have, as part of integration, have standard spokes or templates for integrating with other technologies. And then further to that, in trying to automate the testing of activity on the platform, ServiceNow now has a wide range of quick tests or, again, templated testing for any of the baseline applications that you're working with. And that goes right across the, the different product lines. Now, in the Orlando release, the emphasis has been on three particular themes. The first is now intelligence, making sure that we have AI-driven intelligence across the platform. As I mentioned before, it had started off with the incident space, and now there are elements that can be used in CSM and some of the other product lines. Mobile, in the last release in New York, 
the mobile application was rebuilt from the ground up to make sure that you have native mobile experiences. And so that has been further enhanced as part of this latest release, where you're going to have different applications available based off of the user type that you're going to be. So if you are a service desk agent versus someone that focuses on hardware asset management, there's unique mobile experiences that are available. And then the last piece that you'll see that is further enhanced in the Orlando release are workspaces. ServiceNow has been using portal technology to help in consolidating information and making sure that the look and feel matches your branding. So that same concept now is expanding into all of the different product lines so that you can optimize the different portals to focus on the information relevant to that particular role that they perform. Now, we did want to make sure that we highlight the concept of the integrations because this is a big emphasis of what we have from Idle 4, leverage what we have in our current ecosystem and see how we can make all these pieces of information work together. And this will constantly evolve. So if you are curious about what's available, I encourage you to take a look at the docs page for it, just so that you see what new things are on the horizon or, or may have been added over time. So when we start the focus then on the individual applications, there are plenty of features that are built in or are optional plugins. When we look at incident management, one of the aspects here is the initial setup or the creation of an incident. We do have something that's available that's called the service desk call application. These new call records that you can create, you can add in standard scripts or probing questions to decide whether you are going the path of incident or if you're going to be creating a service request. This is something that could also integrate with a CTI tool set. So it's a, a plugin that you can request of ServiceNow, install it into your instance. And although the, the initial setup, when you look at the form, it can be quite simple in nature, being able to select which information to add into the corresponding record type can become quite integrated with other tool sets. Also, what we have available that is part of the base platform, but oftentimes people overlook it is on-call scheduling. So if you wanted to go and create a standard schedule for work and helping to determine which member of a group is available to complete a task, it would automatically be able to populate, here's the three people that are on call, or here's the individual that currently has an open queue that you could go in and turn on. It's an optional plugin. For the user when they are raising their record if they have some questions that they would like that can help them to refine the information that they're going to include that's where we start seeing the ai component so there's been heavy emphasis in the orlando release on itsm's virtual agent where you can add in standard scripts of questions that the platform is expecting to be asked and then from there standard responses that can lead to either knowledge articles or service request records that can be created or at getting to the point to gather enough information to then start the interaction with a service desk agent. Now for the service desk agents, we have an updated agent workspace. This is a lovely portal that will help to consolidate all the information of the different record types that are assigned to them. We typically do start looking at it from the incident perspective, but you are able to take a look at all record types that are assigned to the agent in that single view. You are also able to raise multiple records at the same time. So if you wanted to have three incidents that you're reviewing and then from there decide to go and raise a problem, you wouldn't have to shift through many records on a single screen. You can just use tabs to shift back and forth between the different record types. Now, if it ends up being something that gets escalated into an overall major incident, a major incident has its own workbench that's available and it leverages communications management so that you can have in the background predefined the collection of resources that you would escalate to. So if you're gonna have different communication managers, resolver groups are going to be involved based off of the selected CI. You don't have to go in and figure out or look at papers to understand that. The platform can automatically have that built out in the background. Going again with the concept of a CTI integration, if you wanted it to automatically open up a conference call and then have all of the notes that are currently in the chat displayed, then you can see all the back and forth analysis details that have been performed in the investigation without having to stop everybody and say, okay, hey, sorry, I'm late. What, uh, what, what's the latest information? 
just take a look at what's available in that workbench layout. Another aspect that's available on the platform that sometimes is overlooked is survey management to the application. It's an optional one for you to go and gather feedback, analyzing the customer satisfaction. And you can have standard questions that are about the incident itself, the experience of going through the incident practice. It could be things that are in relation to the service experience. So what was your service desk response times like? Did you feel that you were supported well when, when we went through the resolution details? Were you comfortable with the level of expertise? Lots of those standard types of questions, they can be built into the survey application. And then you can have logic that will drive different questions to be asked, especially for anything that is high risk or has uh, information security components that we have to accommodate for. Based off of the different answers that are submitted in a survey, we can create coaching loops, we can raise continual improvement records, or if there is something that can go beyond, we could integrate with another tool set to to help us in, in providing that information to the users. So a lot of upfront information can be gathered, right? When we're first raising an incident, and then as we're looking to assign it, making sure that we automate the selection of that. And then for any of the background feedback, we have a method to gather that as well. When we shift over to problem, problem management actually was completely revamped in the last release. And so, or well, in two releases now that we, we have Orlando. So as of Madrid, you'll see that we now have more emphasis on an overall life cycle or the state model as we go through the different activities. There are also updated ITSM roles that were introduced. So we have now a distinction between a problem manager and a problem analyst. And so the problem manager will be able to raise the problem and run through the full life cycle. But if there are certain activities that they need to have completed by other groups, you are able to create tasks. And those tasks then can be assigned using the problem analyst role. The resources can include information. We can put SLAs against them so that we have an expectation for response times on, on activity. Those are all included as part of the latest version of problem. Another aspect that is available here that's a really nice feature is our integration to knowledge management. So ServiceNow does align with the KCS principles. And so there is a template that's included, the last one that you're seeing here on the screen for best practice knowledge integration that has a standard layout for KCS of V6. And so as we get to putting together the known error details, you can publish them into the known error knowledge base and make sure that the knowledge process then kicks off having a standard structure that follows a general industry guidance. For change management, there are actually a lot of inherent baseline functionality that's available for us. One of the first pieces to consider is the blackout and maintenance kit. Many organizations, they'll start off with just standard generic one. But as we start to refine what we're including for our CMDB and all the different CI classes that we may have and who supports them, you can start to tailor those. And that background foundational data can help us as we are first raising a change to decide what would be the best start time or end time to complete the change record. So instead of taking a look at it once we're getting to the review process, you go with that shift left concept let the end users decide what time would work best, knowing what blackout periods, maintenance windows that we have. One other aspect that you can include for them is understanding the potential risk for the request for change. We have two aspects that are built into the platform. One's more of a calculation based off of a few different drop-down values that you would select. But if you do have a standard risk management approach for your organization, whether it's based off of an ISO that you're following or Sarbanes-Oxley, or maybe you're following project management, PMI's interpretation for calculating risk, those can all be set up as surveys using the risk assessment tool set. And the questions that you have in the risk assessment can all have weighted values. And that can help you to understand what priority and a potential overall risk that it can introduce. One other aspect that was updated in the last release is how we asked for approval. Before it was type of activity that would be built into a workflow. And it could be quite rigid because there are all kinds of variations that we may have or different scenarios. Well, with the last release, they introduced change approval policy records. And so you'll just put in in your workflow a relationship to change approval policies 
And from there, you would create, using your regular condition builder, all the different scenarios on who exactly would be needed for the review and approval. So just making it easier for us rather than having to hard code it into the background workflow. Another interesting feature that was introduced as the last release was the integration with discovery and software asset management. So if you're using ServiceNow's discovery solution, the platform can check if there was a change to a CI, whether it was something that was formally reviewed and approved. And if it was not, then it would highlight it by creating an emergency change for you listed as an unauthorized change. And then the change manager can then backtrack and review and find out what, what occurred. The same when it comes to software asset management. So if you are looking at uh, keeping track of the licensing that you have, and if you are hitting a threshold, so if we are 10 above what we have purchased, then we know that there's cost implications. So the platform can inform you that we are over and uh, what we can do to remediate that. So lots of great functionality that's just part of the base platform. Something that is new as part of the Orlando release are updated versions of what we do for agile development. As Idol mentioned, big emphasis on DevOps and, uh, and agile methodologies. And so what ServiceNow has done is come up with an updated approach for release management. So there's release management 2.0. And there are three methods for you to be keeping track of your Agile activities. The Agile development application is based off of Agile Scrum. There's also the SAFE application for the scaled Agile framework. And then we have now further automation that's being included with DevOps. This application, you can integrate with other tool sets. So if you are working with something like Jira, or are using an automation orchestration tool like Jenkins, then the change record can help to initiate what would occur in our releases, the agile record type, and then into this DevOps solution. So lots of great enhancements that can be added on top of the baseline features of change. For the service catalog, so this one continues to be one of the initial focal points of implementing a ServiceNow solution. So if you are looking at how we can improve this, I would definitely recommend taking a look at the portal experience. Portals have become a staple basically of all ServiceNow implementations. And now built into the portal, you'll be able to use the virtual agent. So if you have topic scripts, you can create topic blocks and the resource can ask a question and start looking at creating the appropriate record type or referencing the corresponding knowledge article using the artificial intelligence. Something that has also been updated as part of the last release, further refined as part of Orlando, is the ability for us to test a portal. Many of the other applications are easier to set up because it's one overall table and all the different rules associated to it. In this world, because we may be raising a single request for multiple items, it was always a challenge. And then further to that, adding in a portal experience. So ServiceNow has included new automated tests for the catalog and the different record types that get created, as well as being able to test the portal and what information, what we're looking at and clicking on when you're in the portal layout. Another piece that's part of the baseline features that you may want to look at is what is available as part of hardware asset management. It does have the ability for us to publish our standard hardware models into your service catalog. And from there, have a background workflow to double check if there is an item already available in inventory. So creating a transfer order, or if you are working with standard vendors, options of which vendors to go and procure from and create a purchase order against it. Those are all part of the base solution of hardware asset management. It's just a matter of adjusting the background workflows to have those corresponding record types be created. For knowledge management, so this is another application that was completely reassessed in the last release and has been further refined as part of Orlando. So with the latest version, it has the ability for us to create social question and answer. Those can be reviewed by any resource on the platform. And then any of the information that's part of Q&A stream, we could then take that as our starting point to create a draft knowledge article. We also can take any of the feedback on an article and create actionable feedback records. So rather than having our knowledge managers having to go in and review collection of articles to see if there's anything that needs to be adjusted, any negative feedback, you can then automatically create an actionable feedback record for them to 
now go and double check only those specific articles. Now, if you're looking for being able to have article quality indexes, so actually auditing the articles or version control, those are aspects that are included as part of knowledge management advance. In the past, you would have to turn on something like manage documents as a plugin to have multiple versions for an article. Now it's inherent to the platform in knowledge as long as you go and install the knowledge management advance. So I definitely would encourage you to take a look at that and have some of the common requested features for knowledge just automatically built in. I have mentioned the concept of KCS. So the same can apply for templated approach from incident. So if you're taking any workarounds from incident and you want to publish them into the knowledge base, there is a standard KCS template available for it as well. One other aspect that was introduced in the latest release is knowledge translation management. So if you are looking to have activities for translating an article into multiple languages and then having an audit and validation that we can publish that, there are knowledge translation activity records that can be generated. You just choose the languages that you want them to adhere to, and then you can change the layout depending on who's logging in. So if I log in and I prefer to see everything in Spanish, it'll show me the Spanish translated version rather than the, the English one. Now, that's not to say that the platform would automatically translate it for you. It's creating a task for you to go and keep track of that activity. So if you wanted to create a dashboard to see which articles currently have an English and a Spanish version, then we could create that dashboard for keeping track of that. Now, a lot of this information these are great uh, details that you can review over on the docs page, but we want to make sure that we get a sense of how all of this can help us as we're looking to adopt IDLE 4 in our instances. So I'm going to shift my focus over to my own demo instance. So, Maria, while you do that, I'm going to run your poll really quickly. So give you a minute to get set up and then just want to give you a little time check. We've got about 10 minutes to go till noon. We've got lots of questions stacked up. And just to kind of, as always, make folks aware, if for any reason you need to drop off right at noon, we are recording this session. And so we'll continue on and ask Mario any questions that you might have. But I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll while Mario is getting his demo organized, and then we'll continue. So what release of ServiceNow are you on now? And that's definitely a great question to ask. Is some of the details I mentioned here are features that were introduced in previous releases. So you might want to take a look at it if you're still in Madrid or New York. But there are some aspects that are brand new to Orlando. So if you're curious about some of these features and using it in your instance, you'll need to make sure that it's available for the version that you're on. Well, Mary, one of our questions, in fact, let's just knock this out real quickly. I, kn I know our service asset and configuration management team is using Discovery, but we don't yet use it to auto-create an authorized change request. Is that capability unique to Orlando? So that started in the New York release. So they say our org is running Madrid in our production environment and are currently testing New York. So there you go. Yeah. So you... That explains that. <laughs> Okay, so looks like the responses are slowing down. We've got 9% London, 19% Madrid, 43% New York, 20% release what? Not utilizing ServiceNow. So All right. There we go. So let's go ahead and close. We'll quickly reveal to everybody what we saw. So I guess the folks not using ServiceNow are here for the idle floor part. So we hope that you found that beneficial as well. And if nothing else, you get to kind of take a sneak peek at the new release of ServiceNow. Okay, back to you. Wonderful. So taking a look then at our ServiceNow instance here, I do want to highlight some aspects that I mentioned that would be up front as part of the initial setup that can help us in, in the automation aspects that, that Idle is recommending. So the first here is the common integrations that you'll have for foundational data, your users, your groups, your roles, departments. Those typically are coming from other technologies. So if you have an Active Directory solution or single sign-on, you can use the ITSM guided setup to help you to understand what activities would take place. If you're using Okta, there's an official integration. So the Okta integration was actually updated in the Orlando release. So you can configure role-based entitlements to Okta. And if you want to automate the assignment of applications in ServiceNow based off of user properties, you can set that up using the integration. Let me just show you here. 
very quickly that there are two sections for you to gather that information. And for the Okta experience, once you enable that, you'll have a little guided setup that would go through the different sections on how to go set up the integration. Another big staple for the initial setup is the population of the CMDB. ServiceNow has over 500 tables that you can further extend with CI classes for telecommunications and virtual devices. So you get to close to 700 tables. There is a fantastic common services data model that includes all the recommended mappings for the service related tables and all of the CI class mappings. So you can definitely go and explore that. There are also official integration hub folks with SCCM, SolarWinds. You could use ServiceNow's discovery solution. And if you look on the ServiceNow store, you could find others. I myself worked on an implementation that integrated with HP Logic Monitor. So they were looking to help populate the CMDB with that, as well as share monitoring information into the platform. If you are using the discovery solution, there's also a normalization plugin that you could use to n normalize all that discovered data for a consistent representation within ServiceNow. And that does bring you to another potential application that you can leverage to continue with that theme of automation, event management. So you can set up the event management solution to present the current health of your services with service mapping, and then you can explore the individual CIs that comprise the different services that you offer. You have lovely heat maps, graphical dependency maps that you could use. And you can also set up correlation rules for your alerts from your various tool sets to then automatically generate incidents. Keep in mind, though, that the monitoring tools, they also have their own correlation features. So if the tool set may automatically go to incident management rather than into the event management dashboards, so you may need to tweak where the data is coming into ServiceNow if you are looking to leverage the event management solution. And we don't typically cover that in, in a conversation like this because they are much more technical and it's part of the ITOM suite of ServiceNow, but I do want to recognize that that is a, a capability. Also, I mentioned for the general ServiceNow features in, in the last section here that ServiceNow had the ability to auto-generate emergency change records. That one really works well if you have a discovery solution and a well-established CMDB. And as I mentioned as well for service requests, if you wanted to leverage hardware asset management, you can set up stock rooms and stock rules. And if you hit a threshold, then you could automatically create a transfer order, purchase order, and fulfill them just like a regular service request would be by a stock group manager. So this goes back to the guiding principles of Vital 4, making sure that we integrate our collection of different tool sets, and look for aspects that we can start automating to initiate our practices. Now, as we shift then into how we submit our records, I mentioned that the platform does come with portals. I'm going to show you just a sample one that the platform includes here. And so with the portal, you can dynamically change this to be tailored to your solution, your marketing in the organization. Lots of interesting things that can be done here to make it feel as if it's like an internal site, but all the little portlets or the widgets that you see on the screen, they would be actual connections to record types of the platform. So the as I go and look to submit a request here, I'm going to just submit a request for a standard laptop. The collection of details that are available here, that can help to drive background workflow logic. So if I am looking for a purchase order or transfer order to be generated, certain numbers of reviews and approvals, you would be able to do that. If you're requesting something that is virtual, like requesting a new database, then you can use Integration Hub to automatically provision it and decommission it after the work is done. So if you're coming from any legacy versions of ServiceNow, you may be using orchestration or for some of that automation. Many of the connectors that were part of orchestration are being remade in Integration Hub so that you would still be able to use the workflow editor and orchestration packages until they have been added into Integration Hub. So I'll submit my request there. If I want to go and raise an incident, I can also do that from my portal layout here. And when I am raising the incident, I can put in some general details 
And as I type them in, you'll notice that it's going to give me some search results. So this is that contextual search that I've mentioned before. It's letting me know that in regards to email, there are several service requests that are available for it. There are also knowledge articles. So if this is something that's just a standard activity for the organization, having that concept of models or templated information available is here. Or if it's something that I can self-serve, if there's a question that I had, I can open up a knowledge article and that can help me to close out the activity independently. So I'll submit my incident now. And the user will be able to interact from this portal layout, sending me any additional contacts. And if I respond back, they would get information as well. They can log in here and continue adding details. Or if you're coming from an organization that's heavy on email, you could respond to that automated message and you would see it automatically added into the activity log of your record. Now, if we shift to the view from a service desk agent's layout, so Mario, while you're shifting over, I just want to again thank everybody for attending. If you need to drop off, I know we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for attending and please reach out to us if you have any interest in any of the Idle 4 classes. Again, we'll, we're going to hang in here and the recording is still running. The slides are on our website already. You can, I put the link in the chat room for you and we'll also have the recording available shortly so thank you to anybody that needs to drop off for the rest of you back to mario so for the service desk agent this is just one of the examples of the portals that are available for them and so you can have a summary of all the work that is currently assigned to you you can go into a list layout and see all the record types that you currently have available and so i can take a look at that incident that was just raised and I can start looking at the information here. You'll notice on the far right, it says agent assist. So it will be using the AI to see if there are any knowledge articles that can help me in addressing the, the issue, or if there are service requests, if this by accident came in as an incident record rather than a service request. And if I think that there may be other potential incidents that are raised here, I can start opening up multiple records in this list layout. Let me just open up the next one and then I can start doing my review and potentially correlate them together and run through the rest of the flow for the workaround or to create a corresponding problem record. Now, one other aspect that I want to highlight here for you is the collaboration aspect that, that IDLE emphasizes. So I am able to type into the work notes here and anyone inside ServiceNow would be able to see those updates. You can use the connect experience so that the chat will be a bubble that pops up and you can then start making your, your updates that way. If you're trying to correlate that to any other record type, so if I think that this might have a relationship to another incident, I can use hashtag. So I can put hashtag incident 503 and the information that I'm writing into the chat could now be copied into that record as well. Now, if you're using other collaboration tool sets, the platform has similar functionality in official integrations with Slack as well as Microsoft Teams. You don't have to go with just having it native built into ServiceNow. You can use official integrations to achieve the same type of solution. If you are looking at improving the options that come up when you write into the short descriptions, you can add in metadata and weighted values for the contextual search to make it more re relevant. And that can help you to initiate the corresponding service request for the service request management practice. I won't be able to demo here the mobile experience, but the service now has made great strides in what you can ask for and update from your phone. So if you are curious about that, I do encourage you to take a look at the mobile application development of ServiceNow. Any of the major applications now can have a tailored layout in, in the mobile app. And so the other piece that I want to highlight here for your service desk agents is taking a look at the Kanban layout. So if we go and look under the service desk application at my work, I'll see all the record types that are currently open for this team. Let me shift over to someone that doesn't have quite as many so that I can quickly render for you the information in a Kanban or the visual task board. 
So you can go into any of the columns. So here is the date. I'm going to right click and show the visual task board. And it's going to take all those record types, and it can be any task type, and put them now into a visual task board layout. And I can use drag and drop functionality to go and make adjustments. If I want to have different assignments, I can drag and drop the names onto activities. Or if I just need to make quick updates, I can open up little card layouts of my activities and make my adjustments there. And it does honor any of the business rules that you built into the different record types, all from this one layout. And so you can consolidate multiple details or make it focused on just a certain type of record. For problem management, shifting back here as a problem manager, I am able to go and search for incidents just using my regular condition builder. So I, I can go and see if there are any other record types that match the problem that I'm working with. As I start putting together my analysis details and, and the workaround, I am able to then publish that over into the known error database. And because I have the KCS integration set up, the details that would be passed over to this knowledge article are going to have a standard format once this is published into the knowledge base. And so the last piece I wanted to highlight for you is in change management. So as I go and raise a change record, as I mentioned, if you have set up your blackout schedule, maintenance schedules, then as you select your values, you're associating to a, a CI. And I choose a time frame for it. So I'd like for this to happen next week. It will automatically let me know whether that time frame works. So it's letting me know here conflict has been detected. I can look at the conflicts tab and I see that I fall within blackout window. It's not currently in a maintenance window. I can refine my time frame or I can use a scheduling assistant to see what is the next time frame that works best for the request of this change. And I can use the risk assessment survey to help to understand what the potential risk that this is introducing to the organization. This is just a very simple example of a set of questions. I'll just choose some random values here. And as I submit that, it will automatically update what the potential risk to the organization can be. Now, the last piece here, once the, you do your reviews and approvals, this can be tied over to one of the Agile solutions. So Agile development, safe, or if you are curious for some of the automation aspects, I definitely encourage you to take a look at the DevOps solution so that you can tie to something like Jenkins. All right, team. Now, there is plenty that you can review here in the features and functionality of the platform. I definitely encourage you to take a look at the Now Learning Portal. This is your single source for all the different training aspects for the ServiceNow platform. There are plenty of self-paced on-demand courses. There are also, this is also where you can come and register for instructor-led courses on ma major product suites of ServiceNow. Riverhorse is an authorized training partner and we can help you with many of the different official classes that are available. And if you are curious to become certified on different aspects of ServiceNow, each of the major product lines do have standard certifications based off of a collection of different classes that you take. So to close out, we do want to make sure that we recognize the recommendations that Idle 4 has in introduced. Many of those aspects can be automated using the baseline platform, as well as additional enhancements plugins that are available from ServiceNow. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Uh, Donna, any questions here that we can review and answer? Lots of questions we can review and answer. <laughs> so here we go. You had made a comment about learning from data. And the comment is, I think learning from data is a new muscle for many of us to develop. Do you have any examples of where data was codified or where organizations are using data to improve a process or improve their value chains? 
That's a great question. Well, from the ServiceNow perspective, the first piece really is in being able to gather a lot of data for it to then start providing insights for you. So the recommendation starts off with at least like 100,000 different record types that it can use to help to formulate trends. So if you're looking for any more general insights from there, that's where you'll have to ask for ServiceNow to install is the virtual agent component because it can do comparisons to general industry. We don't typically talk about workbenches here, but it is something that is a free solution that ServiceNow offers. So if you wanted to take a look at sample KPIs and how you compare to other organizations of the same industry or the, your same geography, then that could be used to help start off with some of those recommendations. Anything, Donna, that you can share there on, on your side? No, I mean, I think what we have all learned kind of through the years is that the more we embrace, you know, fact-based decision-making, the more we leverage the data we have available, the more successful you're going to be. Mary and I were talking the other day, I don't know if y'all have seen the stat, but Gartner is saying that 99% of AI initiatives will fail due to a lack of knowledge management capability. So I think the idea that learning from data is a new muscle is a fair statement, but we've got to get good at it and we've got to get it good at it quickly. Otherwise, we run the risk of making lots of changes and improvements that at the end of the day aren't really going to benefit our organizations, right? So do what's important based on what the data is telling you. So kind of specific tool question, you mentioned flow designer, how would that contrast? with execution plans and the typical workflow editor, what would you recommend? Right. So execution <laughs> plans were actually kind of the foundation for what we started seeing be put together for Flow Designer. They were introduced more from the CSM solution. They will still be available for you, same with the regular workflow editor. But as of the last release, the Flow Designer is the new standard for building out workflow in the platform. The Advantage with the flow designer is that you can use common language, just your regular condition builder to set up your initial step. And if you're looking to add in your own scripting, you can create standard actions and invoke them on any flow. So instead of having to hard code individual activities into the workflow editor, you can just have these standard actions and include them yourself. It's also much easier for validation you can choose any record type and test them immediately in comparison to, to what you had for workflow editor. So you'll see as, as of the last release, it's become the official format. It will start to replace what we had for execution plans, uh, original traditional workflows with now these flow types. But the parity in terms of the feature set is very much on par. It's just some of the orchestration aspects that are still being migrated to be available in Flow Designer. Awesome. And hopefully that makes sense to all the technical folks out there. Um, so you had talked a little bit. So the question is, can you provide an example of AI-driven intelligence? So you had talked a little bit about AI and machine learning being helping to categorize things, but examples of AI-driven intelligence. Yeah, so the easy starting point is in understanding what corresponding group or CI record type to associate this to. When you look at the tutorial that they have for setting up the virtual agent piece, you'll see that they talk about the categorization, the priority, the CI that was selected, and then the group. And so the platform will start looking at the available data and start to provide recommendations, or even better, just auto-populates as you start filling in some of those details on, on the form. You can add in further scripting so that it then would automatically correlate to any other record type. So if we have multiple incidents and there's a recommendation for it to automatically create a major incident, it would have a flag at the very top letting you know there are other incidents available. You may want to create this as a major incident. The baseline platform will still expect the major incident manager to validate that. So the message should appear to one of them and then they would invoke the creation of a major incident. But it's going to provide you that context to highlight that, it, that there's an opportunity for that. Uh, so that's just one example. 
I would encourage you to take a look at the Orlando release notes because they are coming up with aspects that can be used across some of the other application types. The, the biggest emphasis as the starting point was incident just because we see the, the most uh, volume of activity takes place in that particular uh, practice. So you actually mentioned as part of that looking at the CI. So the next question is that mature CMDB was mentioned. It seems a lot of organizations may not have a mature CMDB. How important is a mature CMDB in order for customers to take advantage of Idle 4? That's a great question. Donna, maybe if you can provide insight from the Idle 4 side, then I can mention something on the ServiceNow side. It's usually important. And, and part of what Idle 4 does is acknowledge that as organizations are going through digital transformations, our environments are getting much more complex. And so really the only fighting chance you have being efficient and effective with a lot of your idle practices is if you have a handle on what your environment looks like, right? And that really involves, you know, having a mature CMDB. I think the other thing that Idle 4 does is also remind folks that there's lots of tools out there today that help you create that CMDB much more programmatically. So discovery tools and that sort of thing that help allow you to gather that information again automatically. But really, Idle has always been about the integration of your practices across value streams. And that is even more prevalent in Idle 4 and CMDB as kind of that definitive source of information about your environments is critical to all of that. Service now side. It helps to promote that because we do have, as I mentioned, standard integrations with many monitoring tool sets. The one thing I would highlight there to that concept of the mature CMDB is that you want to have normalization between those different sources of truth and make sure that you don't have any overlap between them or redundancy between them that may create a conflict in the data that's being built or the CIs that are being built because then people will lose confidence. So if you are able to help to streamline that and set up normalization rules as they're being created, then it's very easy for you to start to auto-populate what you have in the background. If you're using some of the service mapping capabilities on the platform, then you can roll them up into your higher level services. And so we can have these lovely dashboards that they're available on each CI record actually to understand its upstream and downstream connections. And it will actually make a summary to say there are other incidents or there was a failed change that was raised up and downstream on the, the record types that are connected. And so that that helps you, as, as Don was saying, in, in showing the integration across all the different practices that this incident may have been a cause of problem case that we're working with, a change that uh, had failed. It's something that we have a known error already published. You can see them all in a dashboard view. And that's what we meant by the workspaces. There's more and more workspaces being built right across the platform. Awesome. And Mario, you and I were having this conversation the other day. For those of you who have like a, a change advisor board and there's maybe an excessive number of changes that have to go in front of the change advisor board, very often the reason why organizations have tabs is because they don't have that ability to see what those up and down dependencies are and really be able to visually understand, okay, what are the ramifications of making this change? What else is potentially going to be impacted? Does this eventually roll up to some type of mission critical service? So when you get these types of capabilities in place, then you can truly delegate that authority and allow that decision making to be made by the professionals who are working day in and day out with those environments, not by some body that is removed from that day-to-day -day work. So it's just such a critical part of things. Anyway, so are there chat and call recording plugins or integrations? Right, yeah. So there are official integrations with Slack and Microsoft Teams. There are other chat technologies you can explore on the ServiceNow portal. So if you were to have the CTI integration and you start a phone call and then you want that recording to be copied into a record, there is a possibility. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I can double check for you, follow up, but it is definitely possible if you're looking for more of the audio recording. Excellent. 
I was actually going to ask you this question when you were showing the portal, because I, I thought, I wondered if that's where this comes into play, but if there was going to be any focus on the human resources delivery module today, we were kind of focusing on the ITSM side of things, but Vera, I thought maybe you can comment on human resources delivery module and where that kind of fits into all of this. We have this whole concept of enterprise service management, right, that is, that is in fact very much a part of our conversation today in the IT service management community. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the lovely aspects of using this platform that many of the elements that we spoke about here in ITSM, they are available in the HR world. So if you are looking at raising HR cases, there are standard forms that are available and the background flow to them actually very similar to what we do in incident. If they are more informational, like I want to get the latest benefits booklet, you can have a portal where you would look at a knowledge base that's focused just on HR activities. And I could submit a service request type. It's again, another type of case, but it would be equivalent to what we do as a service request to get some access to information or access to a certain aspect that focused on HR activity. The knowledge base, the, the biggest difference there is usually on the security, especially if you have sensitive information, and terminations and, and so on. But the concept of what we have available for creating an article, having version control, having different layouts for it, all of that applies there as well. I would encourage you to take a look at the HR fundamentals class because they do highlight all of the major aspects that are available in ServiceNow. You can hear from one of the, the specialists there because I'm just letting you know high level functionally that many of the aspects align to what we have in ITSM. Any other questions there, Donna? Is running external reporting tools, for example, Power BI and Tableau on the roadmap for tables other than Incident, which is already there? Ooh, that's a good question. I would have to double check with product development. Typically, it's the ServiceNow platform feeding into other reporting tool sets. So it, you, you'd also have to double check with what Tableau's plans are. It is possible to have flat files that would be shared with other tool sets. So if you wanted to have more information that's just automatically shared into like a Tableau, it is possible. I'd have to double check with the team to see if, if there have been any further developments. Okay. I see there are books available for V4. The full books are the mini books. And I'm sure I would think whoever's answering, asking the question is referring to the little key element guides that we used to have in Idle 3. Are those going to be available? And the answer is I don't know. I actually went to the Axelos site just to see if they were up on the Axelos site, and they are not. So I'll take it as a homework assignment to see if I can figure out if those are going to be available. But as of right now, they're not available. And again, the answer is. I don't know if they will be available. The other place that they might be, um, and I didn't want to take the time to log in during this session, is on my idol. So if you have attended any, if you have taken any idol exam and successfully passed that exam and you put yourself onto the successful candidates register, you get free one year access to my idol, which is where all the practices live. And it's also, they have lots of white papers up there. This is where some of the ancillary publications are going to be. So, Mary, let's talk about DevOps and Agile. So, a couple questions came in and they were kind of how does number one, idol four address the continuous and iterative changes being introduced by DevOps and Agile. There was a comment that DevOps requires a very solid and mature idle practice to be successful. What are you seeing in service now in support of organizations with DevOps practices? So if you don't mind, I'll field the first part of it with idle four, and then would you field the second part with service now? Sound good? Sure does. So with idle four, part of the value proposition for idle four is that the framework is very much embraced and speaks throughout about the importance of aligning with agile, lean, DevOps practices. So if that's kind of throughout all of the publications, in, in the context of the change enablement practice itself, there's very much an emphasis on decreasing the size of individual changes, looking for opportunities to standardize and automate changes, and that in DevOps language, that means by sending them through a CI, CD pipeline, 
making sure there's a feedback loop after every iteration of change planning and change implementation so that we've got that iteration that's occurring as a result of that feedback. Also recognizing the relationship between in practices like change enablement, release, and deployment management in DevOps. You know, DevOps has really changed how we think about things like deployment management and release management. And we now very much understand that they're two separate and distinct practices. So really understanding that and how by decoupling those practices, we have really added a level of safety, for lack of a better term, in terms of how we're able to introduce changes into our environments. And then part of the whole DevOps movement is understanding that there are in organizations ways that they prioritize and manage their work. So here's where we embrace the agile ways of working. Understand that a request for change might actually be an item in a backlog. And that's being managed as part of the normal backlog management process. And then in the context of DevOps, that change is then going to be made through the continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline, and that's going to be done automatically. And that's that's a chain of tools, right? It's no, no one single tool. Mary, you you talk about the, the DevOps module in uh, ServiceNow. Yeah, no, for sure. With the concept of that, tool chain. So what ServiceNow has put together is updates to the Agile Development 2.0 application. So if you are doing all your planning in ServiceNow, or if you're using another tool set like a Jira, you would be able to integrate that to present it in ServiceNow. The advantage is that you can then show that again, your CIs. And then if any issues happen after something has been implemented, the instance problems and changes because all a relational database, then you can create an overall dashboard to, to see all these record types together. But what's new about this DevOps application is that you're able to take all the build aspects that are automated as jobs in other tool sets and just present the results of them in ServiceNow. So if you're using something like Jenkins, it's an open source automation server, you can automate all the activities that take place there. I wanna know how that has been completed so that I can then update my overall change to say, yeah, we've implemented. Now let's move into our post-implementation review activities and close out the chain. So it's, it's looking at methods for us to leverage these other industry standards, processes, and, and then have a home for them in service now so that it can consolidate reporting. It is brand new as part of the Orlando release, and you can request the DevOps application on the ServiceNow store. And I think what it supports really nicely, and for those of you who haven't yet looked at the new practice guides, the change enablement practice guides has in it a table that kind of shows you the life cycle of a change. And it has two columns. Here's the life cycle of a change that you're handling manually, right? And you're sending it through all the typical historical manual approval gates. Here's a change that is a change that is being handled in an automated fashion. And seeing those two side to side is amazing, right? And it's really for folks in the DevOps community who have always pushed back on change management when they or change enablement, let's use our proper vocabulary, when they start to see now that we recognize that in this day and age, there's a difference between a ticket and a record. And what we really need is the record, right? And so we understand that the information that we might have historically gathered in a ticket is, is going to be gathered somewhere else. Some of it's going to be collected and captured automatically as that change makes its way through the pipeline. But what we still want to have for visibility purposes so that we can always answer the question, what changed is that record of the change and then be able to connect that record to our CI, right, so that we can see that historical perspective on that component. Very much recognition in Idle 4 about all the great work that the DevOps community has done and a real, real, real emphasis on kind of streamlining your all of your practices down to a place where you have just enough control to let you capture the information that you need and ensure that you have controls where it's needed for regulatory purposes or governance purposes, but even then when you can automate all that. So you're really seeing the kind of tools and the practices come together. Last question. What about business impact analysis? What's new in that? 
area? There are two applications that you can explore. I by no means am a, an expert on them. There's application portfolio management, and that one will emphasize the applications and roll them up into your overall IT services. There are lots of automation that can be done in the background to then fill in these different dashboards that are available. There's also an updated service portfolio management. And honestly, I, I don't have all the specifics on that one because it's just been introduced as part of the latest release. So I would encourage you to take a look at the docs page or the release notes for that. All right. So, Mario, lots of thank yous. This was awesome. It was excellent seeing these two pieces brought together. Just lots of variations on what an awesome job that you did. And I'll say on behalf of both of our organizations, if either if we can help you in any way, please do not hesitate to reach out. I hope you all are coming away from this seeing that just great things are being done both in the idle community and in the in the context of service now. I think all these pieces, all these things we've been talking about for a lot of years now, it's been what, 10, 15 years since we saw Agile really emerge, DevOps emerge, the introduction and emphasis on lean, it's all coming together, right? It's we're we're really starting to see we can kind of put these pieces together. Thank you very much, Maria. We very much awesome job. We appreciate you being here with us. And uh, thank you to all of you. Next month, I'm actually going to talk about high velocity IT. So for any of you who are in a position where you're being challenged to speed up, where your organizations are undergoing a digital transformation, and you're really looking at and trying to understand what behaviors do we need to have in place to achieve higher velocity? What are the practices and techniques that we really need to address in order to speed up, but not sacrifice quality, not sacrifice stability as we're speeding up, right? Because the reality is business today wants it all. They want it fast. They want it secure. They want it stable. That's what I'm going to talk about next month is high velocity IT. So hope we, we see you then. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Take care, everyone.